Somehow ended up with this. Uh, Mexican place, right? Halfway down the next block. It's like a kind of a funky juke joint thing. Yes, yeah. Oh, it's on the right hand side after. Yeah. <laughs> they told me to come back for happy hour, which is 24, well, not 24 7 till 2 30 in the morning. So I said, I, I, I might come back, but not at 2 30. Yeah. <laughs> Sure. Okay. Great. Thank you. Welcome to UHD Vital Voices for the College of Public Service. Really glad to have you here and have everyone who's online. Uh, we are the College of Public Service. So we do, uh, we have criminal justice, we have education, we have social work. And we're kind of, I think, a cool mix of different perspectives and programs in our college. And because we're at the University of Houston downtown, I know we have a lot of our students here, we care very much about our community. And so we try to think about things that impact our community and we try and uh, educate people who are going to be leaders and advocates for our Houston community and beyond. So Vital Voices is a way to get some of those voices to students and to other professionals to really think deeply about, about issues that impact us. And uh, deadly use of force in police work is one of those issues that we talk about a lot in our college as we think about social work and criminal justice in one department. So I'm very excited to have an expert, Dr. Klinger, here today to talk about that. And I'm going to introduce our center director, Mr. Pilato, who's going to introduce him. You're welcome. And uh, Dean Schwartz is correct. We really uh, try, we, I am just amazed at the professionals that we have here in the college. We really do everything we do is community centered because the three disciplines are very tied together in community service. Um, so we always try to bring in people who can talk to issues that are, are impacting society as a whole. Um, and certainly this is an issue that's been uh, much talked about in the past uh, couple of years, especially. So we uh, reached out to, uh, I reached out at Dr. Kavanaugh's suggestion. Uh, he suggested I call um, Dr. Klinger and invite him. And lo and behold, picked up the phone and was like, sure, why do you want me to come? And so we're glad that you did that. Dr. Klinger was so easy to get him to come down and Dr. Klinger is truly considered to be an expert in this field. So uh, doctor, let me just read you a little bit about him. He'll explain more. Dr. Klinger is a professor of criminology and criminal justice at the University of Missouri in St. Louis. Prior to pursuing an academic career, Professor Klinger worked as a patrol officer of the Los Angeles and Redmond, Washington Police Departments. In 1997, he was the recipient of the American Society of Criminology's inaugural Ruth Kavan Young Scholarship Award for Outstanding Early Career Contributions to the Discipline of Criminal. Professor Klinger's research interests include a broad array of issues in the field of crime and justice, with an emphasis on the organization and actions of the modern police. He has published scholarly manuscripts that address arrest procedures, the use of force, how features of communities how features of communities affect the actions of police officers and terrorism. He has conducted three federally funded research projects dealing with use of force by police officers, two on involved in, uh, shootings and one on police special weapons and tactics or SWAT teams. His book, Into the Kill Zone, A Cop's Eye View of Deadly Force, was published in 2004. So without much further ado, um, let me just tell you that there is water here and there is really good pizza for those of you online. Sorry that you weren't able to join. So maybe you can 
excuse me, maybe next time you come in person to a vital crisis event. But without much further ado, let me introduce uh, Professor Kunda. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me here, and thank you to all the people who are watching on the interwebs. And um, so what I'll do is I'll just start my PowerPoint. Um, and the first thing we're going to talk about is officer-involved shootings as a social issue. Both of the folks that did the introduction have already mentioned this. Whoops. Did I click on something I shouldn't have? I guess I did. Uh, we'll forget that. So police gunfire has become a big issue in the United States, obviously, in the last couple of years. Uh, especially, but really starting in um, seven years ago in 2014 when Mike Brown uh, was killed by Darren Wilson in Ferguson, Missouri. And Ferguson happens to be directly across the interstate, Interstate 70 from my campus. And so I was uh, deeply involved in that from the perspective of folks calling on me from the media to uh, opine about various things. So if you get bored, Google my name, uh, Mike Brown, uh, Ferguson, whatever, and you'll see a bunch of interviews on CNN primarily. But at any rate, um, long before it became this big social issue in the last seven years, it's something that I've paid a lot of attention to, and I'll explain part of that uh, as I move forward here with a little bit more of my biographical information. But the use of deadly force by police is something that academics have been studying not very hard for not very long. The first person to really take a look at it was a guy named Jim Fife who was a mentor of mine at American University, who looked at all the officer-involved shootings that occurred in the uh, city of New York from 1971 to 1975. He wrote his dissertation in 1979. If anybody wants to look at some of the seminal stuff, Fife, F-Y-F-E. But the point is that there was a small cadre of scholars who took a look at this stuff. Jim, a guy named Jeff Alpert, some others, I got involved. And then when Ferguson happened and Ferguson blew up with the rioting and the civil unrest and some of it spread to other parts of the country, it became a big issue. And then <clears throat> when um, the situation happened in uh, Minneapolis with Mr. Floyd's death, everything got even more um, explosive, shall we say. And we all can remember going back one and a half, well, I guess one summer ago, the summer of 2020, all the things. So the point is, this is a, a major social issue. And in fact, I and others have argued that for about the last seven years, it is the number one issue in the field of crime and justice, the number one concern of the American criminal justice system. So it's a big issue. Standard assessments of quote unquote, a bad shooting is this. If you talk to people about a situation where a police officer used deadly force, where they believe the officer shouldn't have, two things are gonna come up. Number one, you got a bad cop. These bad cops need to be punished. Other thing is bad police organizations. That is bad, bad police organizations give rise to um, bad cops, right? And so what should happen is you should fire the shooters, you should prosecute the shooters, you should do something to dismantle perhaps the police department, put it under a consent decree, so on and so forth. And so the example up there, the US DOJ Civil Rights Division is something that will come in oftentimes and take a look at a police organization and oftentimes argue that there needs to be some major overhauls. Advocates are confident, advocates of, of this notion that you need to punish the cops, you need to punish the organization, are confident in their analysis of the problems, the sources of the problems, and the fixes of the problems. They're oftentimes wrong, I argue. And I'm going to offer a completely different take. What I want to do is make an argument that we need to move away from the punitive orientation that the US DOJ has that the criminal justice system has, that a lot of uh, advocates have, defund the police, so on and so forth, and say that what we need to do is move away from trying to analyze police officers' use of deadly force purely in a moral sense of what is right and wrong, and move towards an organizational cultural transmission approach, something that the uh, US DOJ's COPS office and some others have been arguing for for a little while now. What might this look like? <clears throat> create a culture of safety, something that's rooted in the sociology of organizations and two particular aspects of the sociology of organizations. Number one, something called normal accidents, Charles Perot, I will spend more time talking about that, NAT, normal accident theory, and then high reliability organizations. And so that's what I'm gonna be talking about tonight, primarily focusing on an argument that says, that if we really wanna understand bad police shootings, 
that is shootings that shouldn't have happened or didn't need to happen. And oh, by the way, you'll see that I weave in when police officers are shot, oftentimes police officers, we can always talk about police officers getting shot as an illegal act of murder from the moral legal perspective, but from another perspective, we can see these incidents as unnecessary outcomes of police citizen interactions. And I'll explain all that stuff as I move forward. Real quick on my background, just to give a little bit more of my PhD is in sociology from the University of Washington. As was indicated, I'm a professor at the University of Missouri, St. Louis. One thing you might not have known is I spent eight years on the sociology faculty. Is this way where the main campus is, this direction? This dire whichever direction, I was on the, on the faculty at the U of H main campus <clears throat> for eight years, uh, hired as a young assistant, got promoted and then uh, went up to uh, University of Missouri, St. Louis. Before, uh, pursuing my graduate degrees. I spent three and a half years with the Los Angeles Police Department and the Redmond Police Department. Got hired on by LAPD in November of 1980 and then left um, Redmond in, I think, May of 1984. So I've got about three plus years driving a squad car, so on and so forth. And I spent two and a half years with the Washington State Attorney General's Office um, and the Seattle Police Department working on a variety of research projects when I was in um, grad school. Uh, the National Institute of Justice saw fit to give me some money to do a study of special weapons and tactics teams. So I went around the country, rode along with SWAT teams, observed their training, so on and so forth, talked to the guys about, and gals now, um, about how it is that they manage these high-risk operations, so on and so forth. And then I conducted a, a study that was funded by the National Institute of Justice where I interviewed 80 police officers around the country who'd been involved in shootings about a variety of things. And those of you that were here for an earlier presentation saw some of the information about that. And then the Bureau of Justice Assistance about a decade ago funded another study where I interviewed 218 police officers who'd been involved in shootings. Uh, and then I'm a police practices expert in uh, law enforcement litigation. I've actually testified against the Harris County um, Sheriff's Department back in, oh, probably about 17, 18 years ago, to make a very long story short, a guy by the name of Haji Harrison was killed by a um, Harris County deputy. And I don't want to go into the details, but suffice it to say that I thought that it was a, uh, uh, a not good shooting. And so I have some on the ground experience here in Harris County, here in Houston, I actually testified in federal court, wherever the federal courthouse is, as I say, about 17 years ago. Uh, does anyone have any quick questions about my background before I press on? Okay. Oh, I wrote a book. He said I wrote a book, Into the Kill Zone, Cops I View, a Deadly Force. And what happened here is this comes from that first study of the interviews with the 80 officers that I mentioned. And um, I highly recommend it, by the way. So, if, but seriously, if, if you want to get a cop's eye view of deadly force, if you want to understand what police officers experience in their training, in situations where they could have shot but held fire, which I think is something that people don't know much about, but suffice it to say that if you talk to 100 cops who've spent any time on the job, maybe eight to 10 of them will have been involved in a shooting and 70, 80% of them would tell you at least of one situation where they had absolute lawful warrant to pull the trigger, but they didn't. But that's not what we're focusing on tonight, but the third chapter of my book is all about that. Um, anyhow, what are normal accidents? Charles Perot and nuclear power, and some of you are scratching your head going, what in the world is this guy coming from Missouri talking about nuclear power and what does it have to do with officer-involved shootings? Hang on to your hats and hopefully I'll be able to make the argument that will make sense. Charles Perot is an organizational sociologist and uh, he was part of a presidential review commission that was sponsored after the 1979 nuclear accident in Three Mile Island, on Three Mile Island, reactor number two, um, outside of uh, Hershey, Pennsylvania, I believe is where it is. Uh, at any rate, the vast majority of you may have some vague, you heard about it. Those of us that are a little bit older, we remember this pretty remarkably because it was one of these seminal events where we thought that basically the, the Northeast part of the United States might uh, go up in nuclear vapor and that wouldn't be a good thing. At any rate, so he was called in to uh, be one of the members of this commission, and he started looking at what went wrong, and he, he, from that research, spun a theory. And he argues that bad things happen in human-created systems, which can be human technical systems, so human technical systems, which a nuclear power plant is. You don't just put a, push a button like uh, 
Simpsons, right? The guy who pushes the button and the nuclear power plant runs. That's not how it works. You've got this very intricate situation where you've got all sorts of human beings who are interacting with constantly with the technical system that's built. At any rate, he says that when you have that type of a system and things are tightly coupled, and when things involve complex interactions, bad things will happen. And I will be spending more time on this as we move forward. Tight coupling means there's little slack in the system, so problems can quickly propagate. Simplest thing I can do to describe the notion of tight coupling is this. Everybody knows what dominoes are, hopefully. You've all seen, you set up a domino here and a domino here and a domino here and a domino here, and you push one over, nothing happens. The other five or 10 or 100 or whatever you built doesn't matter. But you move those dominoes close enough together so if one hits one, then it sends everything off, right? In a chain reaction. When there is tight coupling, if you have a problem in a system, that system can quickly start to collapse, okay? Complexity, when we've got a very complex system, it's hard to monitor and it's hard to control everything. So if you've got a domino set up and everything's tightly coupled, theoretically, as soon as one thing falls and then it starts to go out of control, if you're aware of it, you could go over and you could grab the two or three dominoes that you just want to take out of the equation. And after maybe 10 or 12 or 15 or 100 or whatever have fallen, then it stops. But if you're not aware that this has happened, the whole thing is going to collapse. And the more things you have to pay attention to, the more likely it is that you're not going to be aware of something going on. And oh, by the way, you designed this little domino thing to work out a certain way, and you don't know that three other people came in and built in other things in the domino system that are going to lead to, so it falls here, and then it goes that way, and it goes this way, so on and so forth, okay? So when we have things that are tightly coupled and things are complexly interactive, that's when bad things are going to happen, according to Charles Perrault. <clears throat> Where does the term normal accidents come from? He says that bad outcomes are normal in tightly coupled, highly complex systems because they are a simple consequence of how the system is built. Not that they're good, but they are expected. Not that you expect it to say, oh, I want this to happen, but somebody taking a 10,000 foot view looks at this and goes, you know what, the way that system is built, it's tightly coupled, it's interactively complex. We can expect bad things to happen, okay? So normal accidents in policing. For some of you, this won't make a whole lot of sense. For others, you'll go, oh, that makes perfect sense. Officers get too close to a suspect, creating an opportunity for the suspect to attack. This is exactly what happened with Mike Brown and Darren Wilson in Ferguson. To make a very long story short, Mike Brown and his running partner are walking down the street, Canfield Avenue or Canfield Drive, can't remember what. Darren Wilson drives by, goes, oh, I think maybe... These are the guys that were involved in this robbery call that I just had, just had. And what he did is he backed his squad car up so that now he is face to face with Michael Brown. I don't want to get too deep into the weeds, but that was the critical error that led to everything going sideways. Because if you're a police officer, you have been trained not to get too close to a robbery suspect. He gets too close to the robbery suspect, Mr. Brown and everything goes sideways. And we can talk in some detail later if anyone wants to get a little bit more information about that. But the point is, this is something that officers do on a regular basis. They get too close, an assault happens, and then they shoot their way out of it. <clears throat> officers get too close, limiting time for diagnosis and decision-making. The Tamir Rice shooting that happened on the heels, essentially, of the Michael Brown shooting. Tamir Rice, a 12-year-old kid, um, is out in a park and he's waving a pistol around. Someone calls up the 911, the operator takes the information, doesn't pass all the information along by the way, because a piece of the information was that the person who was calling it in thought that it might be a toy gun. That information doesn't go out to the cops. You can watch the video and what happens is here's Tamir Rice and here's the squad car and it just comes into the frame and all of a sudden what you've got is you've got a partner officer, the passenger side, about six feet away from Tamir Rice. Tamir Rice starts to pull the gun out of his waistband. The officer shoots and then jumps out. For those of you that have seen the video and all the stuff goes sideways from there. I looked at that and I said, huh, it's a normal accident because he got too close. 
situation that brings in the issue of complexity, there's a lot of innocence around, a lot of innocent people around, and this creates a dilemma for police officers. Because if you think about a micro social system in this room right now, I've got a police officer, so I'm gonna pick on you for a minute. If someone comes in and starts running around with a hatchet or an ax or a gun or something, you have not just the situation that you would have if you're gonna deal with him out on the street or in a bayou or some such thing, which is relatively simple. And when I say out on the street, I'm saying 2.30 in the morning, three in the morning, there's nobody about, but you've got about 30 people that might start running and doing crazy stuff and getting in your line of fire and so on and so forth. And what happens in New York City, unfortunately, because they have literally millions of people there and people are tightly packed, police officers in New York find themselves face to face with bad guys, get involved in shootings and hit women who are in walkers, literally happen, hit little kids, so on and so forth. Because the challenges when things are much more complicated are much greater for the police officer, okay? <clears throat> Continuing with normal accidents. Police officer walks up on traffic stop and is shot. So the first slide was about police officers shooting people where we wish it wouldn't have happened. Number two is we're gonna talk now about police officers getting shot. For those of you that don't know what it, well, let me walk through this, I apologize. Officer walks up on a traffic stop. Who has never been pulled over by the police? Most of you have been pulled over by the police. Those of you that are, um, who just put your hand up, um, you know what a traffic stop is. You know somebody who's been pulled over by the police. So it's one of those things that we know. Police officer walks up and asks for the driver's license and registration, so on and so forth. And every now and then what happens is a police officer walks up and it turns out he's a bad guy or sometimes a bad girl and the person shoots the officer. There's not a whole lot we can do about that because police officers have to, if they're going to enforce the law, walk up on the vehicle. But what police officers have figured out and what police officers for at least 50 years have been trained is that if you have a reasonable suspicion that the person in that vehicle is a bad person, they have a gun, they have some type of other weapon that could harm you, you don't just walk up. You do what's known as a felony stop or a high risk stop, depending on which vernacular you're used to. And what happens is here's the car stop. Here's the police officer on a regular traffic stop. He walks up, boom, boom, he gets shot. In a felony stop, what he does is he gets one, two, three, or four, however many other vehicles he thinks he needs, and he comes back here, excuse me, and he waits back here. And what he does is he orders the people out of the vehicle and bring them back to a position of advantage for the police officer, takes them into custody that way. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, high risk or felony stop. When you have that knowledge, you can do that. At any rate, officers go into a jewelry store to silent an alarm call and get shot. Archie Nagao and Dewey Johnson. I work with Dewey in Hollywood Division, and Dewey is unfortunately no longer alive because it was raining one day in Los Angeles. That, that old song, It Never Rains in Southern California, isn't quite true because it occasionally does. Dewey and Archie Nagao are working a footbeat in Chinatown. A robbery alarm call comes out, 211 silent, we call it, and they have their guns out and they look around into the plate glass window of the jewelry store and Remember, it's Chinatown, and there's three Asian-looking guys. They come in. So they're like, oh, okay, it's raining. We don't want to get rained on. So when they go, unfortunately for them, those three people who waved them in were not the proprietors. They were the robbers, and they had the proprietors down on the ground, and there was a very violent shootout between Dewey and Archie and the three bad guys, and Archie got shot in the neck, and Dewey ran out of ammunition and got basically executed. He's dead. Yes, it's a murder. Yes, there's an assault. But why in the world did they go in? They weren't thinking about this notion of coupling. They weren't thinking about the notion of what can I do to avoid a normal accident? They were trained, by the way, that you don't go in on a robbery alarm. I don't care how much rain it is. I don't care if it's hailing. Whatever the story is, you don't go in. But for some reason, they forgot that. The point is that that's a normal accident in terms of my thinking about police officer involved shootings. <clears throat> officers do a hostage rescue and two of them are shot. Jimmy Veenstra and um, Randy Simmons, LAPD SWAT. There's a citizen who has decided that he wants to kill his family. Police officers get called. The local, I mean, the, uh, the patrol officers spot citizens down inside this house and they're like, this isn't good. 
They take some gunfire, they call the SWAT team. LAPD SWAT shows up, they decide to do what's known as a crisis entry. And I don't wanna get into the details, at any rate, Jimmy and Randy are the first two through the door. And what happens is the suspects start shooting from a secreted position. They both got shot in the face. Unfortunately for Randy, it went through his face and it lodged in the base of his uh, skull and his spinal column, and he's no longer with us. If we think about it once again, in terms of normal accidents, this is an incredibly complicated event. You've got citizens who are shot in front of you. You've got a bad person inside that you can't see. You've got fellow SWAT officers. And by the way, there were still some patrol officers doing some stuff and something bad happened. So a normal accident. What I wanna do, and I'll, I'll announce this real quick. I'm about to walk you through a case study that includes crime scene photographs. This is definitely a PG uh, portion of the um, presentation. If you get queasy, when you look at dead bodies, uh, avert your eyes, leave, shut down your feed, whatever the case might be. At any rate, this was probably the most famous shooting in American law enforcement until Mike Brown got shot by Darren Wilson. I'm going to walk through it quickly, and then we'll walk through it step by step. February 4th, 1999, a little bit before one o'clock in the morning, 1157 Wheeler Avenue in the Bronx, New York. Four officers from the NYPD uh, Special Crime Unit or Crime Suppression Unit, they're in plain clothes. This becomes important, and they're in a plain car. So they're not uniformed officers. They're driving down the street. They spot Diallo outside a vestibule. And a vestibule basically is you've got these brownstones that are connected by you know, interior brick walls. And um, then you've got an exterior door, and then you've got a vestibule that can be of a variety of sizes. And we have the actual size of this vestibule, and you'll see a photo or a, uh, a slide that, that depicts it. And then there's an interior door and that's how you get into the, um, the location. At any rate, they spot Diallo outside the vestibule. He's looking around. It's a little before one in the morning. There had been a push burglar in the area. A push burglar is someone that shoves open doors and goes in. And also there'd been a rapist in the area um, within the last year or two. They're supposed to look for these type of bad people. So a decision is made to stop and question Mr. Diallo. Less than 10 seconds after the squad, it's not a squad car, excuse me, less than 10 seconds after the patrol, the plain clothes car stops, four police officers have fired 41 shots. Amadou Diallo has hit 19 times. He is dead, but there is no weapon. This is Amadou Diallo. This is the vestibule, right? Okay, these uh, cups, you'll see a bunch of them. Those are used to mark evidence before the official placard show up at any rate. But look at this, and I want you to pay attention to the physical layout, the reflectivity, the lighting, so on and so forth, because that becomes important later. Also, pay some attention to this kick plate down here and the fact that you have these imprints. Those are bullet strikes. Another view looking out from the interior door to the exterior door. I guess I can do it this way, can't I? Can you see that? Yeah. So what we've got is we've got about not quite seven and a half feet by just over five feet. It's a very small area. So keep that in mind. This is an exterior shot. And what we are looking at here is the police plainclothes car. And this is the vestibule where the shooting occurred. And this is obviously the next door neighbor vestibule. There's a squad car, evidence markers or cups that will be replaced by evidence markers, excuse me. Pay attention to this. This is stuff that is out of the vestibule, right? Now we have the placards that are marking the evidence. So what happens is they pick up a plastic cup and they put a marker down. This is, these are evidence items that they're looking at. <clears throat> this one in particular is very interesting. This is the curb many, many, many feet away from the vestibule and that is a bullet, okay? That becomes important. This once again, the interior door, excuse me, the exterior door with the interior door behind it. You can see that there's obviously a bunch of misses. 
This is the best picture of the interior door that shows bullet strikes on this metal skid plate or kick plate. Notice the reflection there on this metallic paint. That's Amadou Diallo again. What happened? What happened in those 10 seconds? Here's what happened. Ken Boss is, well, excuse me, the 10 seconds and the seconds leading up to it. Ken Boss is driving. Sean Carroll is in the front passenger seat next to him. Ed McMillan is in the back passenger seat. Richard Murphy is in the back seat behind the driver. Carroll spots Amadou Diallo. They don't know it's Amadou Diallo looking around at not quite one in the morning. He says, hold up. Boss stops and then backs up and stops in front of 1157. And you saw where that vehicle was parked. Carol McMillan, McMillan exit and approach Diallo. Those are the two that are on the passenger side. So the front seat and back seat passenger are closest and they get out and start to approach Mr. Diallo. And the other two officers, the driver and the back seat passenger behind the driver, uh, Murphy, are starting to get out. But they, are, they have to get out of the car and around the car as opposed to just having to get out of the car and move directly, right? Diallo turns when he sees the police officers and runs into the vestibule. Why did Amadou Diallo do that? We don't know, but think about it. It's one o'clock in the morning, approximately, and you're minding your own business in front of your apartment, and you're looking up and down the street, and all of a sudden you see a car stop and four really big guys get out, and they've got body armor, soft body armor, Underneath, they've got sweaters, because remember it is, or sweaters, sweatshirts, jackets, because it is February. And Amadou Diallo likely thinks, holy mackerel, this isn't good. I need to get the heck out of here. And then they say, hold, one of them says, hold up. Well, they're going to rob me. So I'm going to get the heck out of Dodge. So Diallo turns and runs into the vestibule. McMillan and Carroll chase Diallo into the vestibule. Remember, this is only seven foot by five foot. It's not very big. Diallo grabs the interior door with his left hand. So imagine that you're the police officer, you're looking, you're seeing him grab with the left hand, starts to jiggle it, turns his body sideways. So he's looking back at the police officer and reaches somewhere over here. The testimony is not real clear, but somewhere on the right side of his body, right side of his waistband. He begins to bring his right hands towards the officers and in it, is a dark object. Carol shouts gun and starts to shoot. McMillan, who is on the left side, so Carol is here. McMillan is here. McMillan on the left side jumps back and down the steps, firing as he does. So we've got two officers who are already engaging in gunfire, and one of them falls backwards down the steps. Carol thinks the rounds being fired by McMillan are coming from Diallo, and he thinks that McMillan has been shot because he's over here, and he sees muzzle flashes, and he sees his partner disappear out of his line of sight. Oh, well, my partner's been shot. I need to keep shooting. McMillan sees that Diallo is still standing after he falls down, and he keeps shooting. Boss and Murphy run up. They actually run this way, and they are on the sidewalk. They see McMillan fall. They hear the rounds going off. They see muzzle flashes inside the vestibule. And so they fire. Yalo finally drops. Carolyn and McMillan emptied their magazines. They each fired 16 rounds. Boss fired five rounds. Murphy fired four rounds. Yalo had pulled a wallet from his pants pocket. In all likelihood to say, hey guys, take my wallet, don't hurt me. Or maybe at that point, he, he, he figured they were cops and was just going, oh, here's my ID. But whatever the case, he's presenting his wallet. The officers perceive it's a gun, and they do what they just did. The cops are all white. A series of protests come out. Bruce Springsteen writes a song called My American Skin about this. The officers are indicted, but they're acquitted. The city settles the civil suit for a couple few million dollars. I don't believe they ever disclosed exactly how much they paid the Diallo family. It's been 22 years since that cold February night, 1999. But it's still raw for many people in the city of New York. 
Wheeler Avenue, for example, is now called Amadou Diallo Drive, and it's an officer-involved shooting that still receives press mention. If you don't believe me, all you need to do is start tracking from here forward when there's a controversial police shooting, and in some non-trivial percentage of those stories about a controversial shooting in Ferguson, Houston, wherever the case might be, Diallo's name will be brought up, especially on the East Coast and especially in the New York metro area. Let's walk through the Diallo case as a normal accident. Officers are working essentially independently. These four guys hadn't worked together before. They hadn't had a sense of teamwork. They were four independent actors. Remember that notion of interactive complexity? Okay. This creates a highly complex five-person microsocial system, the four officers and Mr. Diallo. Okay. And what one person in this microsocial system does influences the others in unexpected ways because they're so tightly coupled and because things are complexively interactive. Carol shouting gun influences McMullen. McMullen firing influences Boss and Murphy as well as Carol. Diallo is not falling from the bullet strikes. Plus there's a lot of misses, so the cops keep shooting. I don't wanna to get too deep into the weeds, but suffice it to say that what happens to a human body when it's struck by a bullet is not always what you see on TV or in the movies. You get hit by a bullet and you fall over. A very good friend of mine, her story is in uh, my book, Into the Kill Zone. She literally got shot through her heart and she said, it really pissed me off. And so I chased him and I killed him. Now she didn't chase him and kill him because she was upset. She chased him and killed him because he kept trying to kill her. Let me make that real clear. But the point is, that she got shot through the heart and is still in the fight. So number one, a bu a bullets aren't necessarily gonna knock somebody down. The other thing is remember Diallo is this way when he gets shot and the force of the bullets are pushing him against the door. So he's not falling because he's being propped up. He could fall this way, he could fall this way, he could fall this way, but the bullets are striking him. And so he is being pushed that way, okay? Also, if you think about it, less than 50% hit. So most of the bullets these officers fired were missing. Time lag for um, Boss and Murphy means they have less information to go on and define the situation as their partners being shot at and that McMillan has already been shot. So what's happening here is they are crafting a definition of the situation that is completely false because things are tightly coupled and because things are complexively interactive and things are working in a way that is consistent with the definition of we're in a gunfight, okay? Carol and McMillan moving into the vestibule creates tight coupling in that first instance. This creates time constraints regarding the decision about what Diallo is doing. If they were 25 feet back and a wallet comes out, in all likelihood, they wouldn't have felt as threatened. Don't know for sure, but it makes sense theoretically at least, right? So creates a time constraint by being so close. And when you're a few feet away, you've got to quickly decide what's in the hand. You use other cues to help you frame your definition. Oh, he's running away. He didn't show his hands. He's reaching into his side area and he's punching out. That's the term of art we use as we're drawing a gun, we punch out. That's what he's doing. He's pulling a gun on us. He's gonna kill us, right? Also, your fear is higher when you are close to danger. Has anybody ever seen a grizzly bear up close? I've seen grizzly bears in the wild. I've had the good fortune to go to Canada. And I saw a grizzly bear across a river, maybe 50 yards away. I'm like, that's cool. It's a grizzly bear. No big deal. Another time, I saw a grizzly bear literally this close. Scared me three quarters of the way to death. I'm like, this is not good. And I just slowly but surely get the heck out of there. One of the most terrifying things I've ever experienced. Trust me. So fear is higher when you are closer to threat. And so the emotional state that you're in because of this close coupling influences your decision-making. If they had stayed behind cover, behind the cover, remember there were parked vehicles on the street, had they stayed there, or actually they could have stayed down, although being down is a little bit of a tactical disadvantage. I don't want to get into the fine grain details of gunfights. That's a disadvantage. But if you've got hard cover down, it's better to have hard cover down than it is to be up on the same level when you have no cover. But had they stayed behind cover, they might have felt more comfortable and thus made different decisions regarding gunfire. And one thing we do know is McMillan could not have fallen down the stairs backwards if he's on the flat surface of the sidewalk or the street, right? 
The physical layout creates unexpected interactions. The interior door is highly reflective. I asked you to pay attention to that. The paint, that kick plate, and the glass. So the cops see muzzle flash that they believe is coming from Diallo, but it's not. It's the reflection of their own muzzle flash, okay? They define it as gunfire. And if you think about it in your own mind, if someone is holding something and you believe it's a gun, and then you see a bunch of muzzle flash around them, two and two is four. The problem here is two and two didn't equal four, right? Solid surfaces lead to some bullets bouncing back out of the vestibule. So not only do I see muzzle flashes, but bullets are flying back at me. Holy mackerel, I'm getting shot at, okay? McMillan loses balance, falls backwards off the stairs, leaving the other officers to believe he's been shot. I don't know about you, but I guarantee you that I have tripped and fallen more than once in my life. Who's never tripped and fallen? Okay, we've all tripped and fallen. Don't you trip and fall when surfaces are uneven and you've got to go up or down as opposed to completely flat? So this physical structure of the stairs create a situation where it's more likely that you're gonna trip and fall. The key point here, mundane aspects of a situation that are beyond the police officer's control and initially would seem to be irrelevant can come into play. Any questions about the Diallo shooting before I press on to the next? Yeah, real quick. Why didn't they make themselves What? No, they did. Uh, Sean Carroll announced, he said, police, may I have a word with you? They said, that's what he told the, um, the investigators and the investigators and everybody else said, no, that's a bunch of baloney. What they did, what the investigators did is they went out and they looked at his contact cards from previous 500, however many contacts. They interviewed 20, 30, 40, 50 people tell me about this contact you have with this police officer. And they said, well, you know, he's a nice guy. And the really strange thing is he always said, police may have a word with you. That's what he always did. So he identified himself as a police officer. The question is, did Diallo understand it? He's an immigrant, doesn't speak good English, so on and so forth. Any other questions? Yeah. Oh, sure. Absolutely. The, the, the first question was, why didn't the police identify themselves? And I said, one of them did. And so what I was talking about, about the issue of um, Sean Carroll saying, uh, police may have a word with you. That's what, that was the answer to that question. Yeah. Small compliant areas like yeah. that. Are police trained uh, for scenarios like that if they're gonna be shooting in like small areas like that, that that possibility of bullets bouncing off to appear like they're being shot at? Do they do? I am unaware of any training about that particular issue. Um, yeah, the, the question was, are police officers trained about the possibility that bullets could be bouncing around when they're firing in tight areas and therefore be alert to the possibility that you might misinterpret things? I'm not aware of it. All I can say is that I've taught this same basic um, story to a bunch of police officers uh, a bunch of times. And they're like, yeah, this makes perfect sense in terms of one of the things that I want to think about in the future. Okay? Uh, hold on a second, we have a question. Sure. Uh, okay, very good. Let's press on to the next. Okay. Why were four officers in the car together is the question from the, um, the Zoom. Long story short, that's a typical way that NYPD would deploy their crime suppression units. That's basically it. Let's move on to- Can that be considered for future training? Sure, it could be. The question is, can it be considered for future training? Certainly. I think the bigger issue is why would you put four guys together who had never worked together and who hadn't had any opportunity to train together? I think that would be the bigger issue rather than the number. But I, I got to press through this. I can take a bunch of questions after I'm done with my presentation about Diallo or anything else, but we need to get, keep moving. Case study number two, the Christina Rapati shooting. June 3rd, 2006, approximately 11, excuse me, approximately 10.30, 22, 30 hours. 
3950 South LaSalle Avenue, Los Angeles. Rapati and Joe Meyer are working in special problems unit. They're in, uh, they're wearing the uniforms, but they're in a plain car. A black male runs in front of the squad car. Myers is driving, excuse me, Meyer is driving. He brakes. Rapati is the passenger officer. She bails out and gives chase behind the squad car. So it takes a little while for Meyer to get into this situation. The suspect goes up onto a porch, tries to open a door. Does it sound familiar? Rapati follows the suspect and gets so close that she actually grabs him, even closer than Carolyn McMillan in the Diallo shooting. The suspect pulls a 22 caliber revolver out of some area, fires five rounds. Christina is struck under her left arm and she's paralyzed. She drops down. Meyer comes running up, realizes that Christina has been shot, engages the suspect in a pretty quick gun battle and kills the suspect. This is the location. The patrol car is over here. So the foot chase goes this way, up onto the steps, and the suspect is trying to get into this door right here. Just another angle, another shot a little bit closer up, and a further away to give you a, a more global sense. Let's talk about the Rapati shooting as a normal accident. It's a little bit simpler than the Diallo shooting. Chase onto the porch does what? It creates tight coupling. When the suspect drew the gun, Christina was not even aware. She didn't know, she didn't see as Carol and um, McMullen had that something was coming out of somewhere. If she's further away, she likely would have seen. If she would have seen, she likely would have been able to get in the gunfight. So in this situation, her injury is a normal accident. The closeness meant that she's an easier target. Once again, I don't wanna to get too deep into the weeds in this, but suffice it to say that anybody who knows anything about gunfights knows that the closer you are, the more likely you're gonna hit your target and the more likely you're gonna get hit if your target is shooting at you. If she'd been further away, the suspect would have had to do some different things. Number one, he's trying to get in the door. He's gonna to have to acquire her. If she's 10, 15 feet away, where is she? Where's that cop who's chasing me? She's further away, the suspect is more likely to miss when he turns around and starts shooting. And at least theoretically, if she stayed behind the porch stub wall, she would have had once again, what we call hard cover, would have been a superior place for her. Okay. The point is that an officer being shot can be a normal accident, just like a police officer shooting someone that in a situation that could have been avoided can be viewed as a normal accident. So how do we prevent normal accidents? Well, many high danger occupations, many high danger endeavors have really low rates of tragedy, really low rates of bad stuff. So I flew here on an airplane this morning, an aluminum tube at 500 plus miles an hour, six, seven miles, yeah, six, seven miles above the earth. Am I insane? Why do I do that? I do that because civil aviation in the United States is incredibly safe, even though that's an incredibly complicated, interactively complex thing that I'm flying in. Aircraft carriers don't want to get too deep into the weeds. There's this new movie, Maverick Top Gun. If you didn't see the first one, you got to at least see the second one because Val Kilmer is cool no matter what. And uh, at any rate, U.S. aircraft carrier operations, incredibly safe, but incredibly, incredibly dangerous. Because if you think about it, you've got about four and a half acres of metal with aircraft landing, aircraft taking off, a bunch of gasoline, or not gasoline, a bunch of jet fuel, a bunch of other fuel for prop planes, ordnance, bullets, missiles, bombs, incredibly dangerous, hardly ever have a notable accident in a U.S. aircraft carrier. Firefighters, firefighters generally do a really good job of not having bad things happen to them. Organizations of this ilk are called high reliability organizations by some folks that came after Charles Perot. Carlene Roberts, Carl Weick, and some others said, wait a second, Perot is making this argument that complex of interactivity and tight coupling basically mean there's gonna be problems, but we're studying these other organizations that aren't having these problems, how come? And they figure it out. The researchers have figured out what the reasons are, at least they believe they figured out. 
the key is something called mindfulness and not the mindfulness where you meditate and think about, you know, puppies and unicorns and rainbows and all that. For those of you that know anything about that type of mindfulness. But mindfulness is something that develops in high reliability organizations and it has five cultural orientations. First one, preoccupation with failure. Don't worry, I'm gonna go through these real quick and then we'll spend a few minutes on each one. Reluctance to simplify interpretations, sensitivity to operations, commitment to resilience, and deference to expertise. If you have these five things in your organization, you have what you need to be highly reliable. Preoccupation with failure. You don't gloat on your accomplishments. Who follows sports? Okay, the Astros. How come the Astros are in the World Series? Um, because they're good. But among the reasons that they're good and they're in the World Series is because the manager doesn't just go, hey, we won this game, boys. This is great. What he does is he and his coaching staff break down every single pitch and look, was that outfielder or was the left fielder in the proper place? What did the shortstop do? So on and so forth. Because at some point in some game, if that left fielder is in the wrong position, when he should have been here and he's over here, and it didn't matter in that case, because on that pitch struck out the guy, but the ball gets driven there and he's over here when he should have been there, a run could score. You get the, you get the notion. So you don't gloat on your accomplishments. You don't pat yourself on the back, talk about how wonderful you are. You seek to identify all the imperfections in your performance because nothing is ever perfect. I don't care how good you are at anything, nothing is ever perfect. Very few of us are William Tell. William Tell is the guy in lore with the bow and arrow and shoots the apple off his son's head and all that kind of stuff. Most of us aren't that good at anything of that ilk. At any rate, success tends to breed complacency. Success can blind members, organizational members, to possibilities of bad outcomes the next time. Oh, it didn't matter, boss. Everything's fine, partner. We shouldn't be worried about this. Everything's great. And it can create cognitive laziness and corner cutting. Constant vigilance for precursors of failure. That's a piece of preoccupation with failure. You're always looking. What are the things that if conditions were somewhat different could lead to failure? How many of you have driven away without putting your seatbelt on? You forgot at some point in your life to put your seatbelt on. We all have done that at some point in our life. And hopefully we said, wait a second, why am I driving with my seatbelt off? I got to get my seatbelt on, right? Think about all the little things that we do to try to be safe. And sometimes we screw up. So nothing bad happened because you're all here who put your hand up. You didn't die in an automobile accident. But particularly when you're teaching your kids, I remember taking my daughter, I have a 30 year old daughter and 16 years ago, I was teaching her how to drive, or 15 years ago, I guess I was teaching her how to drive, and I am just constantly vigilant on every little thing that she did to make sure she was going to be a safe driver, okay? So there's just an example. Learn all the available lessons from your failures, because you're looking out for your failures, you're not happy with your performance, because you know that with even a, a good performance, because you know you weren't perfect. And then when you do have a failure, when you do make, do make a mistake, dig really deep and identify exactly what the source of that failure was, why that failure came into being, how it played out, all that sort of stuff. Don't accept a very surface account. It says, well, it's because of this boss, or it's because of that partner. Okay? Reluctance to simplify interpretations. Humans act based on definitions of situations. This is sort of a basic sociological dictum. What's going on here? This is a lecture. Some guy came in from St. Louis and is talking to a bunch of people. I don't know any of you. I met a few of you earlier. I spoke with Steve a little bit on the phone, but I didn't know him until he picked me up at the, because I went to the wrong place, by the way. With my, I'm going to say the Uber guy took me to the wrong place. But the point is that what's going on now is y'all are operating based upon a definition of the situation. The definition of the situation is a lecture, a talk. Otherwise, you wouldn't be sitting here listening to me talk, right? Something as simple as when you go out on a date, something as simple as getting into your car, something as simple as merging into traffic. You're basing your behavior on a situation that you have defined in a certain way, okay? But definitions can be wrong. Events are inherently complex, so we have to simplify some. We always have to simplify something. We can't take in all the stimuli that are coming at us. We have to simplify in order to exist. 
problems come when we simplify too much and too soon. Because if we simplify too much and too soon, it produces blind spots and it steers us away from contrary evidence. So let's say that we're on an aircraft carrier and we know that the routine is that everything runs smoothly because you were told it's a high reliability organization. So therefore I'm not gonna be vigilant. I'm not gonna pay much attention. And then what happens is somebody opens up something, something falls out of their pocket, whatever the case might be. For anybody who's been on a, an aircraft carrier, if you're on the deck, you know that that's a big, bad problem. Why is that a big, bad problem that my thumb drive fell out of my pocket on an aircraft carrier deck? Because if that thumb drive gets sucked into a jet engine, the jet engine could flame, that aircraft could explode, and if it happens to be laden with explosives, missiles, or bombs, or ammunition, that could all start cooking off. It's really, really bad. John McCain, the former senator, from um, Arizona who died a couple of years ago, was involved in a horrific accident on a aircraft carrier called the Forrestal off the Gulf of Vietnam. I wanna say it was 1967, if anyone wants to look that up. And that's exactly what happened. A very small situation went sideways and then it propagated and they almost lost the aircraft carrier. Uh, at any rate, the point is that you cannot say, oh, it's not that big a deal. That thing fell down. It's something that you always have to pay attention to. Your definition of the situation is it's safe, but it's not. You're always looking for contrary evidence. HROs design structures and operations to counter this tendency towards simplicity, to counter the tendency that people have to try to make the simplest interpretation in order to operate. They hold meetings to discuss different perspectives in general about stuff. They train and then they retrain on the need to keep an open mind during operations. And then they have after action reports where they seek out differing notions of what went sideways when something did go wrong because they don't wanna learn the wrong lesson. They do not wanna learn the wrong lesson. Sensitivity to operations. Humans tend to follow scripts and routines. Trust me on this. Organizations tend to love policies, procedures, and plans. Talk to one of your professors, talk to the dean. He can tell you about whatever the policies, procedures, and plans are for running the University of Houston, at least at the level that they're operating at, okay? Problems can arise when a situation doesn't match the script, the plan, whatever. This can happen in two ways. Number one, there's a mismatch at the outset. Number two, the situation changes. So the dean here thinks that what he's got is he's got a recalcitrant student who wants to complain about a certain professor or something, and he figures that everything's fine and he thinks not a problem here. Turns out that this student unfortunately is having a psychotic break. And what the dean has to do now is go to another script, which include things such as, and I don't quite know what the deal is here because I've not talked to the dean about this, but get some professional counseling help, get someone who has law enforcement authority, whatever the situation might be, so the situation doesn't spin out of control. At any rate, you have to be sensitive to what is actually happening. If what the dean does is he ignores all of these markers that someone's having a, a student is having a psychotic break, something tragic could occur, okay? Or what could happen in terms of the situation changes, for some reason, the student gets exceptionally angry as things are not going the student's way and the dean's not paying attention to that and he misses these cues. So it could be a mismatch at the outset, could be situational change that is ignored. So you have to be sensitive to the actual operations, not just what your plan says. HROs, high reliability organizations are always mindful of the possibility of a mismatch. And so they form, excuse me, and so this notion of having a mindset of being sensitive to operations is a form of what we call situational awareness. I'm always aware of what's going on around me so that if something is wrong, A, I had a mismatch in my own cognitive script, or B, it turns out that things have changed, I am able to address that issue. Commitment to resilience. Errors are inevitable, even in the best organizations. So we design systems, we train personnel in order to detect problems as soon as possible. We'll go with the dean again. If he catches a particular indicator that a student is having some crisis, early on, he's able to get the proper assets there to assist him with helping this student, okay? So you detect the situation as soon as possible, and then 
if something does go sideways, contain the damage, limit the damage, and then also to bounce back from your errors. Anticipation and preparation are key with the commitment to resilience. So the system will continue to function well. It will continue to not just function, but function well in the face of adversity. Deference to expertise. Strict hierarchies are vulnerable to errors and the propagation of them because as people promote, I'm gonna pick on the Dean again, and they have more power, they have less expertise over the things that they oversee. So my recollection is when he was talking about things, he says he's in charge of criminal, uh, criminal justice, social work and education, is that correct? What's your expertise, your primary expertise? Psychology, oh my goodness, right? But at any rate, the point is that he has promoted to a point where he's got particular administrative skills, but doesn't really know that much about education, doesn't really know that much about criminal justice, doesn't really know that much about social work. Difference to expertise is when there's an issue in social work, he goes and talks to the social workers and says, hey, what do you think about this? Because this is going on. If it's an issue with the education side, he goes and talks to the education folks on his faculty, so on and so forth. At any rate, as hierarchies are built, there's a mismatch between the power to do things because the dean has all the power and his expertise about things beneath him, okay? HROs, high reliability organizations, do not assign power based only on the vertical position. They assign power based upon knowledge. This prevents errors because the right person is designated, <clears throat> the right person designed, the right person set things up. And when errors come, the right person is there to address it, okay? So this, the term of art here is you flatten the organization. You say, rather than having this strict hierarchy, we're gonna flatten the organization. The best example, since we're talking about police shootings and I can think of is police sniper operations. Without getting into the details, there's a time and a place where somebody needs to take a shot from let's just say hundred yards away to kill somebody in order to save a baby who is being butchered, okay? Do I want the chief of police to take that shot? You know who I want? I want somebody from the Houston Police Department Special Weapons and Tactics team who is a sniper, who that is all that he or she has done for the last five years, is practice taking these shots. And he or she knows exactly what to do and they go ahead and they take the shot. You do not want your chief of police to be shooting someone from 100 yards away with a sniper rifle. Okay, James Reason and safety culture. What James Reason did is he built on what the HRO folks said, and he takes a slightly different take on mindfulness. He argues that organizational cultures rooted in mindfulness have four subcultures. These four subcultures can create a safety culture. And organizations with safety cultures possess informed cultures. And this is all about knowledge. Number one, reporting cultures, reporting the errors. So HROs pay attention to errors, but what good is it if Steve identifies an error and doesn't share that information with me? So the first thing is having a culture where information is shared through reporting of bad things and including near misses. So you're gonna report all the information about things that went sideways and reporting on things that could have gone sideways. Adjust culture. Organizations tend to want to punish people for whatever reason. I don't think the Dean wants to punish anybody. So I'm talking about different organizations because educational organizations are pretty different from many others. But there's a time and a place if a faculty member or a staff member does something wrong, the Dean, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the Dean might have to spank them. But <coughs> many organizations will have, pardon me for a second, Many organizations will have a template that says, if something goes wrong, we have to punish somebody. As opposed to saying, let's do an investigation and find out why this went wrong. Maybe the reason why Petty Officer Johnson did this is not because Petty Officer Johnson has a malign heart, it's because we didn't train Petty Officer Johnson appropriately. We're only gonna punish bad, morally reprehensible behavior. If it's something else that went wrong for some other reason, what we'll do is we'll figure out what we can do to improve. We're gonna retrain Johnson and we're gonna change our training 
regimen, okay? Flexible culture. We let all members have input about things. So if the dean's a good dean, what he does when he's got to make an important decision is he thinks about, okay, who are the people in the organization that have some knowledge about this? And then he gets input from all of the people who have relevant knowledge. And he's also open to the possibility that he doesn't know who all the people are. So he asks people, hey, who should I talk to? Okay. A learning culture. When organizations possess, possess the first three, reporting culture, just culture, and flexible culture, organizations can learn from their mistakes. And oh, by the way, you have to have a just culture in order to have a reporting culture. Why? Because if you don't have a just culture, people will be afraid to report missteps. Okay, I should have said that earlier on. Anyway, any rate, learning culture. When organizations possess these first three, they can learn from the problems they encounter and thus improve as time goes on. So you're constantly reviewing, you're constantly learning, you're constantly creating a better organization. Mindlessness in police work. Lack of mindfulness leads directly to officer injury and death. Dewey and Archie were not thinking, they were not mindful. They simplified their interpretation. Robbery alarm in Chinatown, three Asian guys waving us in. The simple interpretation is, those are the owners. Who else would wave us in? Well, we know the bad guys waved them in. Lack of mindfulness creates dangerous culture via a failure to learn. No preoccupation with failure means that activities typically don't get debriefed. One of the things that I learned when I was a young police officer is each and every time that you go on a radio call with your partner, and, and then if it's a little bit bigger group, you take a couple of minutes and you do a debrief and you say, what did you do? What did you do? What did you see? This, that, and everything you can learn. And then you can improve your tactical performance. But unfortunately, that's atypical. It is not at all typical in American policing. SWAT teams are pretty well known for having either a hot wash, some people call it, or a debrief when they have a, an operation. How did the warrant get served? How did they resolve this hostage crisis? Whatever the situation is. But save that most of the time in American law enforcement, there's no mindfulness. It's just, we did this, we served the warrant, we arrested these guys, everything's fine. Not a good way to go. Lack of mindfulness needs to unnecessary officer-involved shootings. Low sensitivity to operations, not recognizing that, oh, I went to talk to this guy and now he's not cooperating. What could it be? Let me recalibrate my definition of the situation. Let me be sensitive to what's going on in this operation and I'm gonna hang back instead of rushing up, for example, okay? And then obviously I'm talking about the Diallo shooting. Teach cops, therefore, to be preoccupied with failure, reluctant to simplify, become sensitive to operations, committed to resilience, and then deferent to expertise. In an informal situation where five patrol officers show up and there is somebody who is acting a fool, running around naked, threatening to kill people, whatever the case might be, when you've got five police officers who show up, somebody should have some crisis intervention training. Number one. Number two, somebody's probably just going to be more naturally skilled at dealing with people who are in emotional crises than other people. Now, if it's in my beat, what I might do is I might say, it's my beat, I'm going to run the show. That's dumb. What I'm going to do is I'm going to defer to my colleague who has the expertise in this area. This is just an example. Okay. This will have line officers practicing safe habits routinely. If what you do is in the academy and in field training and then through in-service training and so on and so forth, you build this type of mindfulness into officers, my argument is that they're gonna practice these habits in the street, they're gonna build mindfulness and they're gonna do a better job. Organization and managers have to have a just discipline system. Once again, in order to get the cops to report about maybe some minor errors that could lead to big errors, You've got to have a just discipline system. You've got to value input from all levels. Who's the current chief of Houston? I know Acevedo is down in Miami now. Thinner. Who? Thinner. Thinner? Thinner. Thinner. Okay. I don't know anything about Thinner, but let's just say that Thinner thinks that the only people that need to be listened to are members of the command staff. 
brain dead because the members of the command staff are completely detached from what's actually going on on the street. What Finner should do is he should seek, he or she, he should identify who are the best guys and the best gals up and down my organizational hierarchy that I can count on to get information if I need information about what's going on in patrol, detectives, my warrant squad, whatever the case might be. You have to value input from all levels. And with these two, a just discipline system and valuing input from all people, you can develop a reporting culture. If the expectation is that the chief is gonna to come to talk to me, I'm gonna to wanna to be able to take advantage of that opportunity. So I'm gonna be willing to talk and I'm gonna be willing to report and everybody's gonna be willing to report, okay? This leads to learning, which creates the informed culture that reason says leads to safety culture. A key here, and this is a big blind spot in American law enforcement, you need to, if you are going to create a mindful safety culture, high, highly reliable police department, you have to promote based upon tactical acumen, not based upon knowledge of the rules and regulations. If I'm out on the street and I am running a tactical operation where I've got a barricaded gunman inside a house, the people that I want are the people that know the most about how to run that operation. So if I'm a captain who shows up or a lieutenant who shows up, whatever the hierarchy is of a particular police department on the scene, and I am designated as now the incident commander, and I don't know anything about tactics, but I tell you what, I know everything about what the general orders are. I know everything about what the regulations are about uniforms and haircuts and you, and, you, know, you name it. What good am I? Well, you pass the exam, you got promoted based upon your knowledge of the rules and regulations, but you don't know the first thing about tactical operations, how it is that you need to work this problem to resolve it peacefully, and then the whole thing goes sideways. So one of the things that American law enforcement has to do, in my humble opinion, is start to promote based upon tactical competency, demonstrated knowledge about how to do the tough pieces of police work that have a highly, excuse me, have a higher elevated likelihood of something going wrong with either an officer being injured or a citizen being injured by the police unnecessarily. So the takeaway, policing as an institution, the polity, that is the folks that run the show in any given political environment, Harris County, Houston, St. Louis, Dallas, whatever, and the public should move away from viewing poor police actions as stemming from bad actors and bad organizations. Yes, there are bad cops. There's no doubt about it. Unfortunately, I've met some bad cops. They need to go. We don't wanna have bad police officers. We don't wanna have police officers who operate from a malign heart and do bad things. And there are some really bad police organizations around the country. You'd be shocked to realize how corrupt some police organizations are. They need to be fixed. Some people have argued that they need to be eliminated. And in fact, there have been cases where police agencies have been taken over either by a state or by a, uh, a county authority. But the point is, I'm not saying that some bad stuff that happens where police officers inappropriately shoot or do something to damage a citizen doesn't happen. That happens, there's bad cops. But that's not the primary driver of this critical problem we have, this critical social issue of police officers using deadly force inappropriately. Similarly, we need to get rid of bad police organizations or radically reform them, but mostly what we need to do is we need to have them buy into the notions of HROs, the notions of James Reason and creating safety culture and creating a desire and a demand of high performance by line officers who are the people that are interacting with the public. So we need to shift our understanding of poor police outcomes, not about bad police organizations, not about bad police officers primarily, but primarily poor police outcomes come from flawed organizational structure and flawed organizational culture. We build a safety culture. And if we do this, we're gonna have fewer citizens shot, we're gonna have fewer officers shot, and we'll get to watch better policing thrive. At least that's my argument. 
So thank you very much for having me here. I am done and we have about what, 15 minutes for Q&A. So thank you. Who's got the first question? First start by, we have someone online who may know the name, Mel Stevenson. Okay. Do you know him? I think I do. He says, please advise Dr. Klinger, his presentation was outstanding. And I was in the class of 225 LAPD 22514. Wow. Uh, tell him to make sure he reaches out to me. Here's my contact information, okay? Right. You got that? Good deal. So we have, we have a question. Does anyone have a question in the room? We have a question online that says, how do you get rid of bad organizations? How do you get rid of bad organizations? Well, there's... It's, it's a challenge. I don't want to get too deep into political weeds and anger anybody, but... Our federal government is quite dysfunctional right now. So how in the world can we expect lesser government entities to do better? Well, go back to that notion of um, organizational reform from the cops office rather than punishing police agencies with the civil rights division. That would be one way. The other thing would be that I argued um, would work is to reform organizations or get rid of organizations by virtue of having the county take over or having the state take over. If you've got an, a, a police organization where the chief of police, the last three chiefs of police have been to uh, federal prison, you've got a problem. Somebody in the state should either use whatever executive authority is vested in the executive office of the governor to get rid of that police organization or have the legislature write a law that gives the governor the authority to do that. And so there are places around the country where this has happened. St. Louis County, um, we have a historical problem where we have, I want to say, 67 municipalities with police departments um, in the county, and the county is way smaller than Harris County, and um, some of these police agencies have five cops. Some of them have 15 cops. I'm not opposed to small police entities because, theoretically at least, a smaller police agency can be more responsive to the citizens. They can know more citizens in terms of face-to-face -face interactions. But if you've got problems, one of the ways that people have talked about addressing this is through consolidation. So what you do is you write a law in Missouri that says the chief of police or the county executive for St. Louis County has the authority to dissolve police departments and take in the good cops and get rid of the bad cops. So there are models out there. Um, I hope I answered the person's question. Question? Who has a question? Yes, in the back. Could you comment the fact that constant vigilance for precursors of failure? Right. Do you think body cameras is something that should be in all police departments? And who should be able to have access to those cameras to supervise and make sure that the cameras are supposed to be going? The question is can we think about um, body cams as an example of constant vigilance or a, or a mechanism for being constantly vigilant? I would say yes, but there are problems. Yes, because if I've got somebody who's squared away, who's reviewing the, um, the body cam video, that person can identify things that, oh, you know, the officer, when he or she walked up, they weren't paying attention to the crowd, or they didn't see that there was a dog running loose, or whatever the case might be. So theoretically, yes, but if you take a situation where a sergeant has span of control, maybe five line officers, or let's say eight line officers that he or she has to monitor. And for each 10 hour shift, we're working four tens now, I've got eight officers. I've got 80 hours for one day of video that I'd have to review. So it becomes problematic. Um, I think a more logical way to constantly monitor and looking for these precursors would be to have, quite frankly, patrol supervisors who are tactically squared away out on the street with his or her guys and gals and watching what they're doing and talking to them. Um, now, one of the ways that you could use the body cams, I think judiciously and at least perhaps effectively, is figure out some sampling design. So what we're going to do is we are going to take 
every week a sergeant is going to each sergeant is going to randomly review four hours worth of body cam just watching an officer going through his or her paces to look at the stuff um and if we did that we would then have these spot checks that might be something that would be worthwhile now your second question i think if i heard you correctly was who should have access to this stuff um that's a difficult one. One of, the, one of the big problems with body cams as far as I'm, or one of the challenges is figuring out privacy rights. And so I'm called to a domestic dispute at your house and it's your worst day and your son is acting a fool and you guys got into a row and you're angry and you said some words that you didn't wanna hear or that you don't want other people to know that you utter. And now I show up, I've got my body cam running and you call me a motherfucker and I'm gonna do this to that. And I'm just like, hey, calm down. You haven't committed a crime. Your son doesn't say that you struck him, so there's no crime, but I'm just there to keep the peace. Is it really fair for your neighbors or a newspaper person to just have access to this randomly so that then we can put out a tweet or something with you going off on me? I think no. So we're pretty early into the curve of knowledge about body cams. I think that um, they hold the promise for a lot of good, mostly because what happens on both sides of the coin, if a cop screws up, a bad cop does something wrong, there it is. If a cop is falsely accused of doing wrong, there it is, right? Then there's a whole other set of issues regarding what the body cam picks up versus what the officer perceived and all that. But I am a fan of body cams, but we have to think long and hard about how we're gonna integrate them into this issue of trying to develop HROs. Real, yeah, one quick follow-up. Uh -huh. Which, what type of police report? Okay. So the question on the floor is, should a police officer be able to look at video before writing a report? My answer is yeah. Because what you want is you want the police officer to be able to document what actually happened. However, if a police officer is involved in a major use of force, particularly a use of deadly force where he or she fires weapons, I don't want the officer looking at that. Two reasons. Number one, because that gives the op officer, if, if he's a sneaky son of a gun or daughter of a gun, the opportunity to align the statement with the video evidence. The second thing is that what will happen is that, and this is one of the things I presented earlier today, police officers don't know all sorts of things about what goes on in a shooting. They don't know if they move left or right. They don't know how many rounds they fired. They don't recall things. There's perceptual anomalies. They don't see things. And so let's say a police officer justifiably shoots you because you're charging at him with a hatchet. Um, but he doesn't remember if you were holding it in your right hand or your left hand. And he doesn't remember whether you took 10 steps or 12 steps or 15 steps or whatever the case might be. He's gonna look or she's gonna look at that video and go, oh, that is different from what I remember. And now they're telling a story that is different from what they experienced at the moment. And that becomes a huge problem. So don't look at video before you give a statement about a shooting. Question here. Online. So, this you know, whole discussion, there's in, in the, the novel and the um, theory, there's no um, mention of racism in the process of okay. uh, shootings. How do you respond to that when it comes up to it? Okay, so the question is, what about racism? And my argument is this let's say hypothetically that Klinger's model, if we could truly create HROs, would reduce shootings of everybody. Right now, the United States, the best estimate is about the, the police kill about a thousand people a year with gunfire. That comes from the Washington Post data that they started collecting in uh, 1990, excuse me, in, in 2015. And what we know is about 25% of the people who've been killed every year are black. And what we know is blacks 12, 13% of the United States population. So there's basically a, an inflation of 100% in terms of the disproportionality. What if I could tell you, excuse me, what if it turned out that I was right and what happened is we create these HROs in American law enforcement and now only 500 people get killed and now only 125 black people get killed. 
We can talk about race all day long. We can talk about institutional racism, systemic racism. We can talk about all this stuff. But what I'm saying is I can save 125 black lives every year, at least hypothetically, theoretically. Do you want to, do you want to spend a lot of time on implicit bias training and a bunch of other things that we don't have any empirical evidence work in terms of changing anybody's behavior? Or do we want to reform police organizations and police practices so the police kill fewer people? So that's my response. Okay. So I'm not insensitive to the issue of race. My argument is that if we created HROs, fewer blacks would be killed as well as every other category. Okay. Yeah. The question of the uh, person over here. Uh, so, say there is a civil rights violation. There was no uh, shooting, but a civil rights violation, or even just a simple complaint from a citizen about an officer. Should that officer in that incident be able to actually view the body? So, someone someone raises a someone files a complaint against a police officer. I'm agnostic. I don't know enough about that, and so I'm not going to comment on it. My 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 gut sense would be no, but I don't know. Okay. Oh, and by the way, the question was for non-shooting complaints, should police officers view body cam, dash cam before they give a statement? Anyway, yeah. Do you think that meetings should be able to There's, you're talking about age or experience and police officers who are younger versus older in terms of drawing their weapon. Um, I don't wanna to get too deep into the weeds on this, but I really don't care about officers drawing weapons. And the reason I don't care about officers drawing weapons is unless they're pointing it, it doesn't matter to me. There are all sorts of times and places where police officers should have their guns out because it's a tactically sound thing to do. Building search, um, even some vehicle stops that are not high risk stops, it might be appropriate for an officer to have a, his firearm or her firearm <clears throat> out of the, the holster. I don't wanna get into the weeds. What I can say is that there is evidence that younger officers tend to get involved in more shootings than older officers. And so the question becomes why? Is it because of inexperience and adrenaline dumps and so on and so forth? Or is it simply because older officers tend to, no, because older officers um, tend to not be as involved, not respond to calls as quickly and not be doing their job as responsibly. We don't know that. Now, there is one piece that came out in uh, 2020, the Annals of the American Academy of Political and Social Sciences, look in the January issue of the Annals of the American Academy of Political and Social Sciences and read, read, I can talk, read Ridgeway's piece. And he talks about in New York, what they did was they were able to look at all the officers that fired weapons and all the officers who didn't fire weapons in situations where at least one officer fired a weapon. One of the interesting things is that the younger officers tended to fire more rounds. The younger officers were the ones that tended to shoot. Now, is this because the older cops are laying back and being lazy? We don't know. Another thing that's fascinating about Ridgeway's research is that black officers were much more likely to shoot and black officers were more likely to fire more rounds than were white officers, which is sort of counter to what we might think. Um, but this issue of experience, theoretically, you're spot on. It makes a whole lot more sense that you want someone who's seasoned and has more experience, but we don't have really clear cut evidence other than out of New York. Okay. Yeah, I want to sure. Online. No, it's okay. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, what is your opinion on the media depiction of police use of deadly force? Um, generally, I think the media depiction of police use of deadly force is shallow and slanted against the police. Okay. What do you tell politicians that want to defund the police? Police defunding rhetoric would seem to inflame a community and serve no purpose. What do I, what would I tell politicians? 
I would be very simple and I would say, okay, you wanted to fund the police, let's start with your neighborhood. And if you are willing to put your skin in the game in that fashion, then we can talk about it. If not, I'm not interested in having that conversation. Is a, I guess, in your opinion, is a bad cop considered a cop who simply made a mistake or obviously did not follow protocol? I apologize. When I'm talking about a bad cop, I'm talking about a malevolent or a malign heart, somebody who is a bad actor, somebody who either got hired on so he could beat people or someone who, during the course of her career, developed um, animus towards people and, and uses force inappropriately. So when I, when I say bad, I mean, people who are purposely doing things that are wrong, as opposed to an officer with a good intention making a mistake. And I apologize for not being clear with that. Will defunding the police affect this type of training for officers? I would think so, because if you take money away, one of the first, place, one of the first places that a bureaucracy is going to cut is training budgets. So I, I would think so, absolutely. But the other thing I would say is I don't know that very many places provide this sort of training. Do you see stop and frisk procedures in the HRO system? Do I see stop and frisk procedures in the HRO system? Um, there would be certain aspects of stop and frisk, and I don't want to get too deep into the weeds about what Terry versus Ohio says and the two prongs, i.e., you have to have reasonable suspicion first to detain, then you have to have independent reasonable suspicion that the person is armed with something dangerous before you can pat them down. But if we think about the notion that stop and frisks are gonna be situations where officers and suspects are closely coupled, and when there are multiple officers and multiple suspects, we could have this witch's brew of complex interactivity, absolutely it would apply. There is absolutely no evidence. The, the issue here is, I'm, I'm assuming they're talking about anomalies when it's a crisis, when there's a, a shootout, let us say, so an officer involved shooting. And the answer is, we don't know. We have no clue. There's evidence from um, experimental research in labs that suggests that officers, in some circumstances, view minorities and treat minorities differently than white suspects. But in terms of perceptual, and, and by the way, the research has found both, that officers are less likely to fire and are slower to fire at blacks. And there's others that suggest that officers are more likely and quicker to fire at blacks. So the, the, the experimental data is, is quite uh, unclear. But this issue of perceptual anomaly, I think I've got the most thorough, I've, I've conducted the most thorough research on perceptual anomalies, and I don't have any indication that the anomalies are greater or lesser based upon status characteristics of opponents. There are corruption within, do you believe that there's corruption within police agencies in the US? Do I believe there's corruption among police agencies where? Oh, absolutely. There's no doubt about it. Um, I don't want to get too deep into the weeds. If you, if you want to read about this, um, a guy named Roger Goldman from University, excuse me, from St. Louis University has talked about bad police officers and bad police organizations that are populated by bad officers. So yes, there's clearly corruption. You look historically um, across the board, there are agencies that have historically had problems and there are officers, you know, it, it's like, the, how many governors of Illinois are presently in federal prison, right? More than one. So yes, there, there, there is systemic corruption in American police, unfortunately, yeah. Final question, is there any reason, going back to the case we discussed earlier, is there any reason that Christina might have chosen to get so close to the suspect in that incident? You know, I, I did not have an opportunity to talk to Christina. I've talked to Joe about it. And so I honestly can't answer about what it is that she was thinking when she closed on the guy that shot her. Sorry. And our final comment, unless anyone has a comment in the room, our final comment is that he needed more time, outstanding for the time he had. So oh. Dr. Uh, uh, appreciate your time, effort, or expertise. Uh, 
Uh, this was a, a wonderful example to us of what Bible Voices was all about. And actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna pick on the officer here. Is there anything in your experience that either confirms or co uh, conflicts with what Dr. Klinger has spoken about? The answer is no, obviously. That there's no conflict. But there we go. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I remember it pretty clear. My video was slightly different. It wasn't me in a minority. It was like all of skin. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I really don't know. It's what it is. The science. Well, thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Many of the points that you outlined in HRO, mm -hmm. a lot of other professions utilize a lot. Absolutely. How do you propose that police departments? change their culture and accept this. Similar to the question and response that you made to the gentleman mm -hmm. comment about racism, mm -hmm. your response was good. I like it because it's, it's a general approach. It's going to capture some of those mm -hmm. qualities or some of those uh, problems mm -hmm. with that approach. But the problem I see in these organizations is how do you change that culture? Okay. How do you get them to accept it? The question on the floor is how do you build an HRO in a police organization? And my argument is that American policing needs to be willing to listen to the experiences of these other organizations, of these other institutions that have done so well. You know, tomorrow I'm going to get back on an aluminum tube and fly at 35,000 feet at 500 miles an hour because I trust civil aviation. If the American public trusted the police as much as they trust airline pilots, we wouldn't have hardly any of these problems. We're always going to have conflict between the cops and the crooks. We're always going to have some situations that spin out of control involving the police and people who have mental and emotional compromise, uh, so on and so forth, but we can certainly reduce it. So I think the, the, the answer is that slowly but surely, the work that I've done, the work that Larry Sherman has done, the work that one of my graduate students, Jordan Pickering, has done, just needs to slowly but surely come into the realm of American policing. So Larry Sherman um, is a, a criminologist of, of quite a lot of renown. If anybody knows anything about the Minneapolis domestic violence experiments from back in the 80s, that's Larry's stuff. But at any rate, um, he wrote a piece almost three years ago now, about the notion of a second great awakening as a mechanism to try to reduce shootings. His argument is the first great awakening in the 1970s and early 80s was a movement to restrict when police officers can shoot through changing policy. So for example, it used to be in New York that police officers could fire warning shots, they could shoot at moving vehicles, and they could shoot at crooks that were running away. And then in 1970, two or three, or four, it might have been 1974, August of 74, they changed their policy that restricted the circumstances. And lo and behold, the amount of shootings went way down. In 1971, the New York City Police Department by themselves killed 91 people and shot an additional 223 people. They're shot over 300 people in 1971. By the end of the decade, they're down in the 20, 30, 40s. Um, pretty remarkable. So what Larry argues is that great awakening, the American police administrator said, hey, here's something we all need to do. We need to change, tighten up our policies and make things more restrictive. His argument is you need to take the stuff that Dave Klinger and Jordan Pickering have written about, the stuff that I'm now writing about, and as you point out, grafting on from other organizations that are, and other institutions that have instituted HROs that are really good run tight ships and don't have very many problems, graph that onto American policing, and it's gonna take some time. I wish I could say, I could go to the IACP, the International Association of Chiefs of Police annual meeting, and say, here's what American policing needs to do, and they all bow down and go, Klinger, we're so happy you're here. That's not gonna happen. That's a pipe dream, and it's not just because, you know, I, hopefully everybody understands I'm being facetious when I say bow down before Klinger. This is not Dave Klinger stuff. All I did was I took Charles Perot's stuff, and Carlene Roberts stuff and Carl White stuff and said, huh, it makes sense that we can apply it to policing. So my hope is, I've got about three more years before I retire from being an academic pinhead. And my hope is that maybe by the time I retire, a few more police agencies go, hey, Larry and Dave seem to have, seem to be onto something. Let's incorporate this in the way that we build our organization. And oh, by the way, 
one of the things I'm going to do as the chief of police is I'm going to start promoting people based upon tactile acumen. I'm going to make sure that the right people are on those critical incidents so that things don't go sideways. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that all my guys and gals are trained in the academy and in first line supervision school about these principles and how to build this organization because that's what I want. But it's not something that currently is, uh, it doesn't have much traction in American policing. So, okay. Do you think six months of training is enough? And how many months of training should be utilized for training? Okay, um, I'm assuming what he's talking about is six months in the police academy. Um, yes and no. It depends on what happens afterwards. What type of field training does the officer have? I'm reading a book right now called Tangled Up in Blue. And it is by a Georgetown law professor, and she decided to become a reserve police officer in the DC Metro Police. And I can't believe she, she hired on in, in 2015 as a reserve, went through the academy. I can't believe how poor her training is, at least as she describes it in the, um, in the book. So it really depends on what the six months is. If it's six months of really good training followed by really good field training, absolutely. If it is six months of not so good stuff, followed by, hey, you're out on your own without field training, not at all. Okay. I understand how, how when it comes to the line of duty, police officers are already on edge. Since being a police officer in your life is on, is on hand, in certain situations, does it make it right for a cop to automatically reach for his or her gun without scoping the scene first? Does it make sense for a police officer to grab his or her gun without scoping the scene? Well, it, it really all depends. Um, I've been involved in situations where I didn't have time to scope the scene because someone's trying to pull a gun. And if someone's trying to pull a gun, the only thing that matters, I already know that my background is clean. The only thing that matters is right there in front of me. If I've got another situation where it's, let's say, a call of a robbery in progress, uh, or a robbery alarm like the one with, that, that Archie and Dewey responded to, um, then I've got plenty of time to take a look and gather information. And in that case, by the way, you should have your gun out when you're responding to a robbery in progress call. Okay? All right. Thank you very much. I'll be around if anybody else has any questions.